Wonderful. We're going to uh, continue the message that we began a few weeks ago. Uh, we skipped one Sunday. It was a wonderful message that was brought last week, praise the Lord, by Ella Carlos. Awesome. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and we're going to chime back into the message entitled, Walking Worthy of Your Vocation. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. We thank you for your word that's forever settled in heaven. I ask you to activate your word, take it from the realm of Logos to the realm of Rhema, that it might be tangible reality in the lives of those who are in the hearing audience. Give me supernatural recall of your word that no flesh might glory in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Again, the title of the message is Walking Worthy of your vocation. How many of y'all walking worthy of your vocation? As a few hands went up, praise the Lord. Uh, there are some additional things that uh, we're going to be talking about and uh, that one should do in order to walk worthy of our vocation that's described uh, in the life of the prophet Elisha. Now, we may have touched this uh, just a little bit last week, uh, but we're going to delve into it again today. I think it's significant that we as believers understand the, the progress that was required in the life of Elisha in order to attain to being the chief prophet after the ascension of Elijah. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. Uh, Elisha was the mentor, uh, the mentee, I should say, of the prophet Elijah. And we're going to look at some of the things that he had to do, practical things in order for him to attain to the vocation that God had given him in Israel. We're going to go to 2 Kings, the second chapter, and uh, the first verse. And if you heard it a few weeks ago, I think it bears repeating. So we're all on the same play, page and in sync. And it reads as follows. I'm reading from the King James Version, 2 Kings, the second chapter, and the first verse. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So they were already in the city of Gilgal, and in some of the previous messages, we talked a lot about Gilgal. We'll say a little bit more about it today, and then we'll move on. The scripture indicates that Elisha uh, knew that, that his master, Elijah, would be taken by the Lord, and so he wanted to make sure he stayed in sync with him, so if there's something beneficial that he can receive, that he could uh, take it during the time that his master was still with him. So the endeavor that he had in his mind for, was for that to take place, and he wanted a double portion of the anointing that was rested upon his mentor, uh, Elijah. I want you to recall that Gilgal is the place where you burst out of man-made paradigms, demonic limitations, and encumbrances uh, that prevent you from attaining to the level that God wants you to as believers in Christ Jesus. Gilgal is where you take the uh, sword of the spirit, the word of God, and cut away all of those things that are contrary to the purposes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever it is that's been holding you in bondage, you eliminate it at Gilgal. So pictorially, we're looking at the different stages that one needs to go by in order to attain to the full status that God has for us. In order to be the believer that God has uh, appointed uh, as a saint today in this fallen world. And so this is what is taking place here. They're actually going through the process and the steps uh, in order for Elisha to attain to the vocation that God has given him and the calling that the Lord has set aside for him as a prophet in Israel. Praise the Lord. And so we need to do the same thing even in our lives. Uh, we uh, talked a little bit about Israel and how that, that it came from the land of Egypt, a place of bondage, and, uh, and how that they ultimately ended up at Gilgal where they had to remove whatever remained after the 40 years of being in the wilderness. They still had to continue to go through the cleansing process to make sure that they were acceptable to the Lord and that they were walking worthy of the vocation that God had given them. Say amen if you're still with me. Amen. And so um, the Lord Jesus is uh, making sure that the devil uh, doesn't take over us and that we come to a point where we say whatever we've been encountering and whatever we've been sensing with our battle with the enemy, uh, Gilgal is where we say enough is enough. That's where you simply just say, I'm not going to allow myself to be subjected to the insults of the enemy and the, this uh, burden that's on me. I'm going to grow beyond it because that's part of the expectation that God has for me as a servant of the living God. So that's what was going on in the life of Elisha. 
he had to go to this place to remind himself that it's a place where it's not only just cleansing, but a removal of things that are contrary to the full purpose and development that God has for us believers. You know, there's some things you can do and still make it to heaven. Do y'all know that? See, everything you do, every sin is not one that damages you to hell. The word sin simply means the missing of the mark. There are some marks that you can't miss. You know, we can't, we can't use uh, the name of the Lord in vain. Uh, we can't speak against the Holy Spirit. We can't be a liar. We can't be a, a, a soothsayer. Uh, we can't be sleeping around, praise God. We have to get married. So there's a lot of things that are in the Word of God. <laughs> the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, starting at the 18th verse. I'm not going to go there today. Uh, he goes on there for about a verse and a half, talking about things that will damn you to hell. He said, if you do these, kind of, these particular sins, uh, you will not enter into the pearly gates. And will not enter means you're not going to make it, no matter what. Uh, I know grace covered all your past sins, but you have some future sins after you confess Jesus as Lord that you continue to indulge in. And uh, so when you stand before him, he that is dirty, let him be dirty still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is clean, let him be clean still. And that's one of the last warnings, pretty much, in the book of Revelations. You know, uh, John the Revelator told us that, that uh, we got to walk according to the confession and according to the vocation that uh, has been assigned to us as believers. So we can't continue to practice sin. Now you can do some of those things that will damn you to hell as long as you get before the Lord and say, oh, I'm sorry, I really mean it, and, and ask for his forgiveness. He said he'll cover those sins and expunge them. And uh, it'll be just as if you never did it. But the Lord knows you did it. But the point is that he'll treat you in a way that is uh, a, a good feeling to have. That the Lord has forgiven me. Uh, the, the condemnation that goes along with the sin you're involved in, you can kick it to the curb then. The devil can, has no right to come and condemn you. Once you uh, ask the Lord to forgive you of a trespass, he wipes it away, he cleanses it, and you're in right standing with him again. You're in fellowship with him. And then you should continue, praise the Lord, until finally you get to the point where you're not doing any sin at all. Any sins that will damn you to hell. Some things will stay with us probably until we, we die. We'll probably lose rewards for them. But at least they're not the sins of a sort that's going to damn us to hell. So each, one, each one of us are built a certain way. And uh, there's certain things that are just in our anatomy and our makeup. And so you lose rewards for some of those things. But the things that the Lord is clear about that you can't indulge in, and you continue to keep going back. See, the Bible talks about that. The dog has returned to his vomit and the sow to wallowing in the mire. And so, you know, Peter makes it real clear because Peter makes it very clear. There comes a point where we have to go beyond the things that were entrapping us in the past and begin to ascend and develop to the vocation level that God has assigned us as believers. Can't continue. Praise the Lord. I was listening to a man yesterday on radio, actually on television. And uh, I had to turn the channel. I, man, I mean, the stuff he was saying that the Lord would condone. And I, I told my wife, there's one fellow who looked like he was curious and that he was concerned that he really didn't embrace what this preacher was telling him. That, you know, all you, once you've asked the Lord to forgive you, all your past sins, this is not true. All your present sins and your future sins are automatically covered by the blood that Jesus shed. That's a lie. Both face a lie. When I heard that, I couldn't continue. I said, Let, let's turn. <laughs> uh, he wouldn't have said sins that are past there in the, in the book of, uh, where is that at? The book of, uh, Acts. I think it's in the book of Acts, yeah. And uh, sins that are past, we talked there. The third uh, verse no, is Romans. Romans, the third chapter, and the 24th and 25th verse. 25th verse is where it's found. Sins that are past. You go there and look at it. It doesn't say sins that we are continually doing and sins of the future. And I, I just didn't, I couldn't understand. He tried to clean it up, but his intention was that we're going to make sure these people know. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to make sure that they know the way I know it, the way I'm going to teach it. Yeah, it's the uh, Romans, the third chapter. Uh, and... Uh, 25th verse here. My, my print is so small, I can't hardly see it anymore. <laughs> get some more. Whom God, let's go to the 25th verse of uh, Romans number three. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation 
through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, the payment of sins. What does it say that? That are past. Sins that are past. Remission is paid. Christ's death on Calvary's cross pays the sins that are past. You see that? Through the forbearance of, of, of God. And so what happened, what that means is that when you come to the Lord, he forgives you of all your past sins. You ask the Lord to forgive you and you ask the Lord to direct your life. When you say, I make you the Lord of my life, that's saying all my past sins needs to be covered, Lord God. But then you have to practice salvation. You got to live like a believer. You can't live like a devil and call yourself a saint. Now, of course, John gets into this in great depth uh, in the starting in the second chapter of uh, 1 John. Let's go to the third chapter and uh, the, the second chapter and read that whole chapter. And it makes it very clear you can't continue to practice sin. If you go to the first chapter, he makes it clear too. In, in order to stay in fellowship with the Lord, you can't continue to practice sins. You must walk in the light as he is in the light. And then you have fellowship with him. We have fellowship one to another. Praise the Lord. So you don't have fellowship with the Lord if you're continually staying in that uh, uh, state of broken fellowship with him. You've never gone to the altar and asked the Lord to forgive you. And if you've done something, that's with the Holy Spirit, to convict the world of sin. You're in this world, and his job is to make sure you know that if you fall and if you miss the mark, then the Holy Spirit is going to bother you. And if he doesn't bother you after a certain period of time, that means that you've been calloused over. You didn't practice that sin so long that the Holy Spirit cannot reach your heart with the waters of life. And you know some people like that. And that's one of the dangers of being in the church and for a period of time where you know all the things of God and then you just turn, turn around and go backwards. And that's why the Bible says there's no, nothing left uh, to, to bring you back into the presence of the Lord. I mean, you, there's a sin where you've gone so far that God's grace is still there, but it can't reach you because your heart is all callous over because the practice you over and over, it just hardens you. Just think about that. If, if you, I used to be in karate years ago in, in uh, uh, where was that? Oakland. And I used to take classes there and all that. And I was pretty good. I was pretty good. And they have a Milwaukee board, I think is how you see it. It's a, a board that they would practice on to harden up the nuzzle, knuckles of their, their fists. And they would pound that over and over. You probably see it on TV, some of the karate movies. And so some of those guys, the, the, the knuckles on their hands are just callous. So it might be another half inch on them. They could hit a wall, it wouldn't hurt. They could hit a board, and most of the time it would break. But even as they hit it, the callus would protect their hand, and their hands would actually bought, bounce off the wall. They could hit the wall with all this strength, and just bounce off if it didn't break. And so that's the point that happens. You get calloused over from practicing sin. Uh, the conviction of the Lord doesn't penetrate. You just continue doing it, and you think it's okay because the Lord hasn't taken your life. You know, God is a merciful God, as long suffering to us, us with, that none should perish, but they all should come to repentance. So he wants us to come to repentance. So, you know, uh, what happens, unfortunately, is that it takes a lot more prayer, praise God, and intercession for a person who's practiced uh, a certain sin so long, they have a hard time coming back. I had a relative that was in our family who had been saved at one point. And uh, just indulged in, in drugs, and the drugs that uh, invaded their mind and just really messed them up bad. You know, uh, and they, uh, the family sent her to our house, and we we're going to clean her up. And so she's at our house, and we prayed when she first got there. When she first came, she's like a dead person walking. Nothing spiritual would penetrate. We talked to her, and she said, yeah, like it wasn't nothing. You, don't you believe in the Lord? Yeah, I believe in the Lord. But you can tell it didn't come from the heart. It just came from the mouth. Because they only, she wanted to tell us what we want, want to hear. But I think we kept on praying and the Holy Ghost broke it. She began to weep and cry. And the Lord restored her. Teary salvation. That's how you can tell. When there's no emotion in a person. You know, I know these guys teach. Oh, we shouldn't be emotional and all that. If you don't see any emotion. When you're talking about the things of God, they've gone too far. They've carried, they began to callous over. If, if people don't begin to continually talk about what the Bible, the essence of what the word says, people will practice any kind of sin they want. So if you go to a church that says it's okay, it doesn't matter, it's covered. You don't have to pray for anything. God already knows what you're going to ask him for. So you don't have to use of praying. So all that kind of rationale is not in sync with what the word of God is told us. You know, 
We're supposed to pray as my wife reminded me this week. So you're supposed to pray without ceasing. <laughs> yeah, that's the word of God. So we always want to find a place to insert uh, our, our, our communion with the Lord. And so whether you're working, driving out in your car, whatever you're doing, you always find time during the day to have a, a fellowship with the Lord, to pray with him, to pray to him, to ask him to assist you and to help you in the affairs of life. So unfortunately, uh, that scripture that I read to you in the book of uh, Romans, the third chapter and 25th, is misquoted many times and not used appropriately. And so people just say, I confess Jesus as Lord. I've been faithful to the church, but I got my things I want to do on the side and the Lord doesn't care. That's the lie that was communicated on TV yesterday. And I said, now he's going to get a good spanking for that. I turned. Yeah, I couldn't. In 10 minutes, I heard him. I just, he just never fixed it, never cleaned it up. Um, let me just go a step further. What he was saying is sins that were in the past in the Old Testament. All those sins are covered <laughs> because Jesus died on Calvary's cross. None of the sins are covered unless you come and ask the Lord to forgive you or to make him the Lord of your life. You understand that? So, you know, if you don't come and uh, approach the throne, and ask for his mercy and his grace, then you're still in the same state you're in. So salvation is available for everybody. It's available. But you have to act upon it. You know, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then the, the Bible makes it clear that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of the Lord. So you got to hear somebody got to preach a message somewhere in order for you to even get saved. You can't get saved unless you hear the word of God preached. From a gospel preacher. And then the Holy Spirit then convicts your heart. Based upon the word you heard. To make Jesus the Lord of your life. And if you're never going through that process. You're out swimming on the, the beach on Sunday. You know. You're going on the, these trips to climb mountains and all of that. You know. Mental ascent is not enough. The devils believe and tremble the Bible says. They believe that God is who he is. And who Jesus is who he is. But that's not enough to get saved. You got to make him the Lord of your life. You have to repent and convert. That's one of the first messages that's preached by Peter in the third chapter, praise God, of the book of Acts, 3 and 19. And he says, you know, we need to repent. That means to identify it with the Lord and to state that what you were doing was wrong. Repentance means to acknowledge that what you were involved in was not pleasing to God. And secondarily, and this is the other part that's left out, you have to convert. You have to stop doing it. The word conversion, you pass I, I preach it a number of times. You got to change your attitude and your behavior. Uh, in order that you might, the sins might be covered, as it says in that same verse, and that you might partake of the refreshing that flows from the presence of the Lord. So the implication is that your sins are not blotted out. So even if you say, oh, yeah, well, I was doing it wrong, you know, I was say, sucking on a reefer and running women, all that. That was wrong. That's wrong. But the question is, yeah, you said it's wrong, but are you going to stop doing it? I've been getting drunk. I've been getting drunk for 15 years. And Lord knew I was getting drunk. So every now and then, I have to get drunk. <laughs> but really, I'm just telling you the rationale of people. You know? And if I go to a, go to a restaurant and uh, they're serving liquor, I have to have a hit. You know? Or you're on drugs. But I, you know, let me tell you, this one of the pastors, I'm not going to mention his name. He, he said to me, he said, when he goes to these uh, sports events outside, back then, I don't say, I guess he's still doing today. And people light up, they call it marijuana, and now they can change the name because it's kosher to go and sit in a club and smoke all day. What's the name of what they call it now? They call it cannabis. It ain't nothing marijuana. It ain't marijuana. It's all this. Cannabis supposed to be cleaner and purified and all that. And uh, <laughs> anyway, you know. well, it's funny, you still hide. You don't have your faculties. But that's what man will do. He'll take something that's wicked and, and uh, pass a law so it's okay. You know, in, in the past, and throughout the word of God, homosexuality has always been a sin. But when man comes around, he'll pass a law. Well, they okay. And we're going to promote it on TV. And we're going to always, in all the movies that you watch, whether you like it or not, we're going to put some gay action in there for you to try and allure you. And then whenever you talk about kids, we're going to make sure that they're teaching this stuff in the schools, even though throughout the word of God, 
is that which is rejected and that which will send you and damn you to hell. I'm not going my job was not to get into that today, but I just want to make the point is you have to continue the things of God. And that's what this is all about is development to get to where God wants you to get. And that's what was happening with Elijah taking Elisha along with him under his arm to show him how a man of God, especially a prophet, lives. So he took him city to city and demonstrated things that he should learn if he's going to be taking his place, if he's indeed the heir apparent, as the Lord had demonstrated before, that he was to take the place of Elisha, Elijah, excuse me, when he was ascended on high, when the Lord raptured him. And so uh, the point is that if, if you uh, stop doing or stop indulging those sins, then you're practicing righteousness as Jesus practiced righteousness when he was here. And he wants us to do the same thing. You can't continue in the same vein, getting drunk. See, that's that old stuff that we're supposed to cut away, right. praise God, when we get to the place of cleansing, the place of circumcis circumcision, which is Gilgal. That's where they did the initial act of circumcision. They cut out the old nature. Uh, they, that's what they were demonstrating. And uh, to put on a new. And that's what we're to do in our minds when we come to live for the Lord. As things are identified to us by the Holy Spirit, sometimes in conviction, sometimes just as a warning, then you cleanse that out. The Lord, forgive me. Stop practicing that. Stop going over the house of people that are going to get you drunk. Right now. Just tell them, I, I can't come over there anymore. I've changed my life. Live for the Lord. They'll test you. They'll probably say, come on over, brother. So-and-so says, you know, I've got homies from the, from the field. You know, they're over here. We're all having a good time. We're watching a, a good game. Uh, he wants you to come back. We got the ribs. Cooking the ribs, man, they're spicy and they're good. You know, praise the Lord. And, uh, and if you want a little bit to drink, we got a little bit to drink, too. So I mean, it's up to you if you don't want to come. But you, you don't have to drink. But I just want you to know we do have it here. Uh, that's, a, that's a temptation. Especially if you use a drunkest person at the party. You know, I tell people who have problems with alcohol, I say, I'm not going to wear around it. You can't take one drink. You, you got marked by it. You can help yourself. You haven't grown. Well, I could take it back. No, no. I tell, I tell them, you say, how long, Pastor? I said, at least three years. You got to stay away from the, that crew. Now, if, if your company requires you to go somewhere, you can go. Praise the Lord. But be very careful. The devil is a sneaky rascal. <laughs> He's telling you, you know, you'll be strung out. Same thing with drugs. So this, I'm going to finish the story about this pastor. He was with, in the, you know, selling drugs, taking it and everything. Missing work, getting fired over and over. And he, he told me whenever they go to a game, outdoor, he said he could smell in the air marijuana. He said, I can smell it. Most people may not, but as soon as it's in the air, I, I can smell it. And then all thoughts come back to my mind. <laughs> and I have to cast them down. And so then he said, I have to be careful, especially when he first got saved. He said it took him a number of years to get to the point where that, that smell didn't affect him in his mind, you know, in his behavior. And so I just say this to people. If you have a problem with that, first guy used to run women or one man, you can't be going to those forums where you're going to run them again or they're going to run you. And you end up falling into sin again. Then you, then you condemn and you oh, I, I thought I was a believer and the devil's on sitting on the shoulder here saying, you're a dirty rascal. You have never changed. And so it makes it hard to come back to the Lord. You're saying that the Lord will forgive you but then self-condemnation keeps you from coming back to the Lord and asking for him to assist you. That's enough on that. And so, uh, so enough is enough is what you have to say. You have to come to that conclusion yourself. Pastor can't do it for you or the preacher. So we need to appropriate the benefits that the Lord has given us through his word. And Gilgal is an indication that you're getting rid of the old endemic nature and you're going to begin to live your life as a child of God all the time, every day, throughout the day, at nighttime, wherever you go, you're gonna live like a, a child of God. Now, some of these people are pretty bad out there, you know. And if you're cussing, you may a cuss where it might slip out at first. You have to ask the Lord to help you. Say, forgive me, but those people just crossed the line. I'm not quite there yet. And if you keep doing it pretty soon, a few years from there, maybe a few months, you won't be doing that. You know, and you'll know what's gonna come next. This is what they're gonna do next. And and I'm not going to bless them out. I'm just going to just ignore it. Keep going. And that's what happened. 
having your senses exercised through use. So they say the fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews. You know, that's how we grow. You know, we have to engage certain things whether we like it or not. Are you with me? And that will make sure those things that you're supposed to have grown beyond will be presented to you. And you have to resist the enemy and he shall what? Flee from you. So that's what, it's your job to do that. Not somebody else for you. And then the money, if you're a thief, they're going to make sure the money everywhere for you to steal. Well, I'm just telling you, you know, people will leave money, leave their purse on the desk the next time. You know, if it out, you know, they won't know. They don't have any cameras in here. All that, you know, wicked stuff. So the devil will present you whatever it is you're having a difficulty with. And he'll embellish what you remembered in the past. So it makes it easy to fail. Okay, don't do that. If it happens, and if you happen to fail, to ask the Lord to help you and strengthen you with might by your spirit and the inward man. And that the next time I want to win. And, and, and the next time, do that. Resist the enemy. Take authority over him. Quote the word if you have to. Uh, praise the Lord. That's good. Before for gospel church. Y'all know that, right? And so here we found that something took place. Elijah had taken, uh, they had gone to Gilgal. It was a good place to be at. And uh, nothing wrong with being a place where you're manifesting and talking about where God has brought you from, how you've been cleaned up and all that, and how you cut off all the things of the enemy. And you put on the, uh, the cloak of a child of God. But then notice here, um, uh, Elijah began to tell him that it's time to move on. You can't tear it here any longer. See, some people get so excited with, oh, I'm having a good time here. It comes to a point where you have to grow up to the next level. It's uncomfortable to move on to the next uh, uh, frontage road, to the next challenge that's in front of you. It's more comfortable to just stay right where you are, and a lot of people do that. And so Elijah told Elijah to tarry at Gilgal, but he didn't really mean it. His test to see what was in his heart, see if he had developed beyond that. Both of oh, I'm having such a good time here, I'll never go nowhere else. I said, it was a test to see if he was willing to be developed fully in the things of God. So I would test you. You can be in some a good area. Might even be your job if you're in good connection with the Lord and, you, and you're living by the Holy Spirit, living by the, the scriptures. You know, uh, the job is a good job. They pay you well. And then the Lord give you in your dream. He'll give you a word. It's time to move on. And you're thinking, now I've been here for five years. My salary is high as ever been. People not bother me anymore. I'm the boss. So is this the devil or is this the Lord talking to me? And you should check. You're supposed to test all things. Hold fast to that, which is good. So you do have to test it, but the Lord will come that way sometimes. He has come that way with me a number of times. And you have to be able to sort because you've been walking with the Lord. You know his voice. You have fellowship with him. And that's what was wrong with Adam in the beginning. He had fellowship with the Lord there in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. You know, and when it was time for him to walk with the Lord, he didn't show up that day because he had sinned. He had partaken of the forbidden tree. And so he wasn't where he's supposed to be to walk with the Lord. And the Lord said, he yelled out. He said, oh, Adam, where art thou? And that's what he's doing to us. We're not in a place where normally we would be uh, having communion with the Lord. And the Lord asked him, where are you? He said, we out here hiding among the trees. And the Lord knew he had fallen. He said, have you been taking up the tree that I tell you not to partake of? And he was caught. That quick. So let's continue here. And so um, we need to make sure we grow in Christ and that we prepare ourselves for the stages and the levels that God wants us to go through in order to attain to full development. Praise the Lord. In Luke, the ninth chapter, uh, verse 62, I mentioned this last week, I believe. It says, and Jesus said unto him, uh, people who gathered asked the question of him. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. That, those are hard words. I mean, most preachers today won't read that. They're trying to find a version that will make it say something a little different than that. <laughs> but I think every one of you know that. You mean that if I let my hand off the plow and I'm doing the work of the Lord, the Lord is saying, I'm not fit for the kingdom of God if I let my hand off. And the angels know. You know, and they wrote it down in the book of works that you let go of the work and the charter that God had given you. Nobody else may know, but the angels know. 
And you know that you let go. And the devil knew. He's right there to tell you what you are. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so the Empire version says, Jesus said unto him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back to the things, listen, to the things behind, things behind is fit for the kingdom of God. See, those things are supposed to stay behind. You're not supposed to bring them to the fore. Leave it where they are. The person described by Jesus is, uh, as unfit is one who is not suitable, right, acceptable, or, or useful for the kingdom of God. If you look that word up in the Greek, these are the definitions that you get in English. <laughs> this does not mean that the person cannot be saved. I mentioned that before. You can still get saved. Yes, Lord, forgive you. If you keep doing it over and over again, you'll be in a callous over. There's a, there's a consequence for indulging in something that you're supposed to have grown beyond. Yeah. You keep doing it over and over again, you callous over pretty soon in your mind. It's not sin to you. So we wonder, how is it that a person was saved, preaching the gospel and all of that? Now I ain't seen them for 10 years, and five years. What they doing? What has happened is they've grown beyond the point where the condemnation, the Lord can't uh, cause them. Uh, what's the word? The devil condemns. But the Lord does what? He uh, is another word that's used there instead. And what? Yeah, he convicts us. If you look it up, conviction is different than uh, condemnation is for a person who's just a dirty rascal. Uh, conviction is for a person who still has hope to get back. And so that's what the Lord tries to do, convict us uh, through the Holy Spirit to get us to repent and come back to where we were. But if you get to a point where it doesn't bother you anymore, he's given up on you. See, you know, the Lord's grace will never leave. No, his grace is still here. But it depends on where you are as to whether it's going to work anymore. Five years gone by, I don't have to go to church anymore. Ten years have gone by. The last time I've been to church, ten years. Well, well, God's a God of grace. Yeah. But are you appropriating your grace? Yeah. And have you broke, how many commandments have you broken or have you forgotten what the word says about it? You follow by now, you've forgotten the things of God. And so you're not convicted because the word's not there to remind you of the things that you uh, need to adhere to as a child of God. Uh, let's move on. And so, um, praise the Lord. I'm going to move on a little bit here. Uh, the Bible precedence was established when the angel of the Lord warned Lot. That's another example of people looking back. And for those who are not familiar with that uh, text, I'll read it here. And his family uh, was not to look back at the wicked city of Sodom, listen here, meaning uh, Scorch and or Burnt and Gomorrah. These are the two cities, wicked cities, that the Lord dropped a fire and brimstone on and destroyed. It says, meaning a ruinous heap. So Gomorrah means a ruinous heap. And uh, after their deliverance during the judgment of the Lord, destroying the cities by raining down fire and brimstone upon them. Let's go to Genesis 19 and 12 to get a little setting here so we can all understand sin. And the two men, the angels of God. So we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and we're talking about Lot. And uh, there's more information in, if you go to the 19th chapter that sets this up. But these two men, they call them men, they actually were angels. They're angels of God. You understand what I mean? Uh, he's talking now to Lot because they're getting ready to rain down fire and brimstone upon uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And but uh, Abraham had prayed for his nephew Lot in hopes that he could be spared and all of his family. And I forgot what the number it may have started 20 and 15 and, and then 10. And you know, I think 10 was as low as he went. He said, If there are 10 people that are living in the city, you know, would you spare it? They're living for you. And the Lord said, Yes. And I think uh, Abraham was afraid to go down to two or <laughs> one. So he stopped. <laughs> and so, uh, knowing that God's a merciful God. You know, and so that's what happened here. And so over here it says, have you others here, uh, sons-in-laws or your sons or your daughters, uh, whomever you have in the city, bring them out of this place. Did you see that? For we will spoil and destroy Sodom for the outcry. You know, see, the Lord has been listening. The outcry is shriek against its people. Notice that in this something the Lord is listening in heaven about your behavior. Has grown great before the Lord. The sins that they're indulging in, contrary to God's word, come great. And he has sent us to destroy it. 
the, the gracious God, the people depend so much on that grace while they're doing their, their sins and things. It's making it real clear right here. He's listening to see what's going on in your city, what's going on in your world, you know, and certain boundaries, once they're crossed, the Lord will judge you. And he has the right to judge you. He's the judge of all the earth. Stand with me here. 14th verse. And Lot went out and spoke to his son, sons-in-law uh, who were to marry his daughters. I know it says this in the, I think, King James Version. But actually, uh, if you look in the Greek, in the case, they were already married. So the, the two guys that he went to talk to to try and get them to come out, leave the city of Sodom, they had already married his wives. Which asked, which raises the question, why weren't they in the house? There was somewhere they had no business being. And watch this. And uh, he said, and said, uh, up, get out of this place. This is Lot talking to him. For the Lord will spoil and destroy, y'all stand with me here, this city. But look, he seemed to his sons-in-law to be only joking. I want to say something. I was going to leave that. You know, they thought he was a jokester. Oh, man, it couldn't possibly happen. Because he probably was joking with him and, and talking the way he should have been talking, not talking as a child of God. This indicated that Lot had not carried himself as a servant of the Lord, of God. When his sons-in-law could not determine when he was being really serious with him, must have been a whole bunch of times where he wasn't. He had an uncle that way. He ended up getting saved in the end. He always had a, a joke or a lie about something. We were always laughing with him. But he got saved. I was so happy. That was only a few years ago. He's up in age, and uh, he received Jesus as Lord of his life. A few days before he died, one of my cousins led him to the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? And he used to go around with these little things that buzz you behind. You know, you put it on his chair and you sit down and you jump up. That's the kind of practical jokes he plays. And he goes way beyond that. But he's just full of that. And uh, so it's hard to tell. Is he telling the truth or is he a lie? You ever met a person like that? They be telling him, and they'll swear on God, you know, on the Bible and everything else. But when it's all said and done, they're lying. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> I'm sure you've encountered those kind of people. Now, watch this here. The Bible, the Lord addressed this in the Bible. In Leviticus, the 19th chapter and the 19th verse. And he said this. You shall not swear by my name. You're not supposed to swear about the Lord. Uh, falsely. Neither shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Then Jesus comes along in Matthew, the fifth chapter, and uh, the 37th verse says the following. Let your yes be simply yes. And your no, simply no. And then he, Jesus said this. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. So he's a guard our speech. And uh, the Bible, even Paul talks about jesting, joking and jesting and all that. We're not supposed to indulge in that. It ain't no fun. Well, you, you better be careful what you do. Because that one thing there can end up putting you in hell if you haven't tried to stop it. You know, so uh, I'm not going to get into that today. That's enough here. But uh, in the New Testament, you can get it. Paul gets into it a number of places. So there's a time to be, to have levity in your speech. You just have to be careful with the verbiage and the contents of it. Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's just leave it alone. So the uh, biblical precedent has, is established. So when the angel of the Lord born Lot and his family, not to look back at the wicked city of Sodom, meaning scorch, and uh, we already went through that. Gomorrah, meaning a, a place, a ruinous heap. And that's what they were living in. Um, the following is a story in uh, Genesis, the uh, 19th chapter. And... Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to read it here. I think that's what I read. It was already. Yeah. You know, and we're, we're going to skip to uh, Genesis, the 19th chapter. And we're going to start here. That's where we left off. It says, when morning came, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and two daughters who are here, and be off, lest you two be consumed and swept away in the iniquity and punishment of the city. Uh, but while he lingered, no, uh, Lot didn't move when he should have moved. The men seized him, the two angels of God, and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, 
for the Lord was merciful to them. Merciful to Lot, that's what it says, him. And they brought him forth and set him outside the city and left him there. So his, his wife was with him, his two daughters were with him, and the Lord's trying to get him out of harm's way. Isn't it something precious? The Lord tries best to get you to a place of safety, but people still fight and resist. Observe that the scripture says that Lot and his family lingered. And that word lingered means um, to, um, I, I want to get the word here. It means question. The linger uh, is the implication is that the questioning rather than taking action, hesitating, being reluctant. This means that Lot and his family were resisting the angel's instruction. Therefore, the angels had to grab them by the hand and by force take them to a place of safety. And uh, the name Lot, I think, I don't know if I got into this, means veiled and covered. We talked about this many times in the past, or wrapped up in self. That's what he was. And so we see something that takes place at the very end here. Let's go to Genesis, the 17th chapter. At 21st, and when they had brought them forward, uh, they said, Escape for your life, do not look behind you or stop anywhere in the whole valley. Escape to the mountain of Moab, lest you be consumed. He said, If you stop and you look back or go back, you're going to be consumed by the uh, fire and the brimstone. 18th verse, and Lot said to him, Oh, no, that my lords, behold, now your servant has found favor in your saints. People are trying to. Negotiate with the Lord. <laughs> Found favor in the sight, and you have magnified your kindness and mercy. People, some people know how to talk, don't they? Mercy to me and save my life, but I cannot escape to the mountains, lest the evil overtake me and I die. 20th verse. See now, yonder city, it's near enough to flee to. It is a little city. Oh, let my, me escape to it. It is a little one. And my life will be saved. So here he is. He told him it's a wicked place. Don't look back. He's actually in his heart looking back right here. He wants to be real close to it. It's an ignoble place, but I'll live in an ignoble place as long as it's close to Sodom and Gomorrah. Smith, he was in unbelief too. He didn't believe the fire and brimstone was going to come down from heaven. But he wouldn't have wanted to watch this happen. Lot's response to the angel's instruction indicated that he had no faith in their words. Else he would have not have asked them to modify the instructions the Lord had given. Lot's response reminds me of many professed believers today who believe that their confession of Jesus as Lord is sufficient and that they do not need to pursue. And I'm using just one of them, baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is manifested by speaking in other tongues or any other of the charismatic gifts. They're doing it right now, I'm talking it down. But anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Although it is true that one who has confessed Jesus uh, with their mouth as the Lord of their life is saved. Praise God. As far as the Lord is concerned. Praise God. And uh, because they uh, uh, embrace Jesus being raised from the dead, that he died for their sins. But there's a whole host of other things that will cause you to lose rewards. They may end up making it to heaven because nobody ever told them about it and they never pursued it. But because they didn't pursue it, because they didn't uh, actually execute it, uh, they are going to lose rewards because they didn't take the things of God that was revealed to them to the next level. Yeah. You with me here? Yeah. Now, as I was in a certain other denomination, they said, they're going to hell. Now, I can't go there far because the scripture didn't say that. If they live uh, safe as they can live safe and don't breach any of the other commandments, even though they have never spoken in tongues, they can still go to heaven. Thief on the cross, he never spoke in tongues. He just, by faith, embraced Jesus as his Lord. And the Bible, and Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me where? In paradise. The only person that will go there were saved people. So if you're saved, you, and regardless of how much you know, if you genuinely make that confession, Jesus is Lord, if you happen to die at that time, you will go to heaven. Praise the Lord. And so I, I'm not going to go to Bema. See, we talk about that a lot. Uh, Genesis, the 19th chapter. We're almost done. Verses 21 through 26. And the angel said, See, I have yielded to your entreaty concerning the things also. I will not destroy the city, notice the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, of which you have spoken. Uh, make haste and take refuge there, for I cannot do anything. Notice, I can't, the angels are saying, I can't do anything until you arrive there. Okay, and that's where we, that's where we get the idea with the rapture, you know. The rapture take place before the Antichrist comes and the seven years of Jacob's trouble. Because the Lord is not going to allow us to have to participate and that's what some would say, but the, the terrible things are going to happen during uh, the seven years, uh, the tribulation period. 
Therefore, the name of the city was Zoar, meaning little, the 23rd verse. The sun uh, risen, was risen over the earth when Lot entered jo uh, Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Simon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from God out of heaven. 25th verse. He, uh, he overthrew, uh, destroyed, and he ended those cities and all of Adelaide Valley and all of the inhabitants of that city. And uh, what grew on the ground, so just the ground was scorched. Uh, but Lot's wife looked back from behind him, behind her husband, where she come, where they come from. And she became a pillar of salt. Some of y'all remember that. Huh? How many of you have never heard that before? Y'all heard it. Praise God. This preacher was preaching good. Uh, the instruction of the angels are clear. Do not look back behind you or stop anywhere in the whole valley. Yet we see Lot's wife looking back. I mean, you know, she's wrapped up just like her husband. He probably was at fault. Wrapping her up in the things that were in, taking place in that city. And that got down in her spirit. And judged for her disobedience. When she turned uh, into a pillar of salt. Even Jesus referenced uh, Lot's wife uh, as a caution to we who live today, saying the following in Luke, the 17th chapter, verse 32 to 33. I'm going to read from the Message Bible because it's pretty clear. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. That's what Jesus said. Next verse. If you grasp and cling to life on your terms, you'll lose it. But if you let life go, you will uh, get life. On God's terms. I thought that was pretty clear. Get things on God's terms, not your terms. And that, that ties back into what Law was trying to do. He's trying to get into a position in another place he had no business going to. He had no business going to Sodom and Gomorrah. He was driven by fleshy desires, not by what the Bible would say. And Abraham, because he was not driven by that, the Lord, after he got rid of Lot, he took him aside. He said, you see all that land in front of you? As far as the eyes can see. If you can see it, you can have it. And God gave him all that land. Praise God. And that was a scene, actually, uh, he couldn't see as far as the Lord was going to give him in terms of the thousands of acres that was going to be his. Praise God. But if see, it's a scene that's in the spirit. If you can see it in the spirit, you can have it. And then uh, I talked about this last week, I think. The Lord gave him a place called memory, the fatness of God. Because, you know, he was wrapped up in the things of this world. He's wrapped up in the Lord. And so... Uh, I don't know when I started today. Um, give me a few more minutes and I will stop, okay? Uh, so we talked about Joe Air. There's a lot that goes along with that to show the consequences of not obeying God. Even though the Lord didn't consume Lot with the fire and the brimstone, uh, he ended up going to the mountains where he, the Lord had told him to go in the first place. When he got to the mountains, his daughters uh, uh, caused him to commit... Uh, what do you call it when you're having incest? And uh, watch this. The Moabites came out and the Amorites. And uh, so there would not have been any Amorites, or any Moabites to contend with Israel while they were going through their 40 years in the wilderness. You see what happens? See, the Lord may let you live and all that, but, but there are certain things that are produced that are from wicked actions. And what some of them saw, that shall he also reap. And that's what happened there. Now, he may not reap, but all of his offspring reap because of him. The Moabites, who were ultimately wiped out at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. The Amorites were all killed off, his family and his offspring. They didn't need to have to do that. If he had just done right as a servant of God. And all he was was a nephew of, of Abraham. But he didn't walk as a child of God. And look at the consequences of that. And all the Israelis that were killed and hurt, and uh, you all the way back to Balaam. Even Balaam continued the same thing. Balaam was a prophet of God, but he chose not to walk as he should. Money got him. Now that happens to a lot of believers. He preaches today. They caught up and don't preach the gospel because of money. What's well, going to happen to the people? If I tell them the truth, they're going to leave. won't have any money. See, your source is not in the people. Your source is in the Lord. And the Lord touches the heart of the people that are supposed to be there. Just as he's doing here in this ministry. He tells the heart of the people. You have to go in the ear and talk about you. If you don't give, God going to do this to you. He ain't going to do nothing. He ain't going to do nothing. No. And, and there's thousands of them. Now, you can see last year with all these lying prophets that went forward. One lie, 
And I'm saying, he watered that group too. He's a lion rascal. And I thought he was a child of God. Lion rascal, lion on God. Prophet lion. Uh, actually, prophet lion, profiteering off of the people of God. You know, if I get this right, then, then all these people going to come join, go on TV and watch me and come to my church. Your church aren't really big enough. Where well, you need to have another bigger church? You can't even manage a church by yourself. You got about 10, 15, 20 preachers in various capacities doing things you can't do because you got too many people. You're greedy. And that's what happened to Balaam. He became greedy because uh, Balak wanted to know uh, the Israelis, uh, I can see them. There's thousands up there. They're going to take over my country. Moab. I'm part of Moab. I'm the king. And uh, I've heard about all the astounding little stop a minute. All the astounding things that their God has done. I'm afraid there's got to be an Achilles heel, something that we can do to cause him to stumble and trip. And then Balaam, who the Bible originally calls him a prophet of God, told him what the secret was. He said, if you could get them to do something that would cause God to turn his back on them, then it would be weak like any other people. And you go and take control of them. And that's what happened. He went and told them. Their weak spot was uh, fast, wicked women, loose women. That's really, that's what took them down. And their leaders and uh, seduced the leaders with these women. And then they were able to be wiped out. Isn't that terrible? The, even the people who are innocent got wiped out because of the leaders that gotten involved with the, those folks. And then, uh, praise the Lord, I won't get into all of it. But then at the very end, the Bible said that they killed all those soldiers and people that were warning against Israel because they'd come back and ask the Lord to forgive them. And when he forgave them, he killed all the people that's part of the, the host of the Moabites and the host of the Amorites. And guess what they did? Then uh, the Bible says he killed all those guys who had taken control of Israel. And he said, and that soothsayer, now he's no longer the prophet of God. The soothsayer uh, was also killed. They named him, the Bible says. And Balaam, the soothsayer, was also killed along with the host and with the numbers. So my point is that that there's a lot of of that message. You can be a bona fide prophet of God, as he was. Talking with God, had, had uh, conversation with God about four or five times. And they had, his, his mind was so thick with uh, money, avarice and money and position that he didn't realize that God was playing with him because he knew it was in his heart. So he was a prophet all the way up until Israel was subdued by uh, the Moabites. And then right after that, the Lord calls him a soothsayer, not a, not a person of God. So you got to continue with the Lord until the end. Yeah. Then you get a well, You can't halfway. Well, for years I was a prophet of God. And I was in what he was showing up was the truth. Because when you stand before the Lord, so I did many mighty works in your name. Cast out devils in your name. I never knew you. Cast them into hell. And you know, a lot of people are going to be that way. You know, uh, I, I'm thinking about something that I saw when I was a young man. Miracles, astounding miracles taking place. They're going to stand before the Lord and say that if they don't get it right. Like some of them are still alive. Not too many. But a few of them are still alive. So they're going to go back and repent and get it right before the Lord. That's what he's going to say to them. See, he, he said, I never knew you because he looks who's going to be his child of God from the foundation of the earth. He looks for the end of your life. And at the end of the life, which one of them are going to be saints? Are y'all hear me? Yeah. He doesn't care about all the stuff you've done. At the end of your life, when you die... The Lord looks at the ledgers and said, okay, there's a lot of things. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. But at the time that he died, was he saved? Was he a child of God? If he was, there's just be rewards. If it wasn't nothing, they crossed the line. If they had come back and genuinely asked the Lord to forgive them, all that stuff was covered. And they go into the pearly gates. But uh, a lot of stuff that they did was terrible. So they're going to lose rewards when they stand before the beam of seat. Stuff, secret stuff you don't know about that was wicked. How they were manipulating people and to get the money and all of that. You don't get reward for that. I, I know I have none of that part there. The Lord must want y'all to hear that. So if you don't continue till the very end, you will not get a crown of life. If you don't, as you go along, you mess up, say, Lord, I'm sorry. I really mean it. And keep on going. 
You're not going to get a, a reward at the end. And hell is a terrible place to go. Yeah. Now, y'all, you know, I can teach some of that stuff. Y'all have me. I haven't talked too much about hell. But if you hear about hell, if your heart is right, you'll get saved and live for the Lord. I think I'm going to, I got a scripture. I have a, a whole message on hell. I haven't talked about it in probably in 15, 20 years. I think I'm going to dig it up. Praise the Lord. And preach it. Praise God. Thank you for being here today. Go with God. We'll continue here. We got just a little bit left. We're going to talk about each of those places that uh, uh, Elijah took Elisha and how it correlates to what we have to do here in order for us to be fully developed in the things of God. Go with God in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog, or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www.sjwofcc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.